this meeting of the Minnesota Senate Agricultural Broadband and Rural Development Committee from Monday, February 19th, 2024 is now officially in session. How's it going? It's good to see you again. Long time no see. It's great to be back. We got some new faces here, so we wanted to have some, uh, an opportunity for uh, you get to know the committee and the folks that we're working with a bit real quick first. So if we could, um, let's start back over here in the page zone. Could you guys come up and say hi and introduce yourself, please? You guys got to speak into a microphone. Oh, okay. All right, we'll do it. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm CJ Larson. Uh, I recently graduated from the U, and I'm spending some time in the Senate here, and I'm really happy to get to know you all. So, thank you. Hi, my name is Princess, and I originally graduated from the U as well, and I'm the lead Senate page here. I'm Michaela Harchi, and I'm a page for this committee. I went to UW-Stout. My name is Olivia. I just came here from the Iowa Senate, actually. Um, they say hello. <laughs> Congratulations on your evolution. Uh, and back over on this side, I think we've got some other folks hanging out back there. I know Mason's back there. Mason, would you come up and say hi for us, please? You gotta speak into a microphone for the record, please. Hi everyone, my name is Mason. I'm Senator Putnam's intern this session. Look forward to working with you all. Amanda, say hi. Two, please. Hi, oh, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Amanda Peterson. Um, I'm our DFL caucus researcher for agriculture and commerce. Excellent. Awesome, please, Senator Dame Sue. Thank you for that, Senator Names. Flip the switch. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Hagenau, and I'm interning for Senator Dames this session. Awesome. awesome. Uh, anybody else we got to meet? I mean, you know the rest of us. We're all pretty old. Uh, but anybody else who's new and uh, joining us? Yes? All right. Well, so that's who uh, we're going to be working with uh, this session, and I'm incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to, to meet these new folks and to have uh, this opportunity to work with all of you uh, for what's best for Minnesota agriculture. I do want to take a moment first to talk a little bit about what we've done for the past eight months because we've been awful busy. Uh, this committee and members have gone on close to 50 uh, different um, meetings over the course of the past year when it comes to going to different farms, uh, different folks who work in agriculture, different processing plants. We have shown up for Minnesota agriculture in these different spaces. I want to take this opportunity, too, to thank Ms. Borromeo for organizing all of those sessions, uh, for um, uh, especially uh, Ms. Painter and Mr. Olofsson, who didn't have to go to a single farm but was, were at most of them, uh, which was very impressive, and also the individual members. Uh, Senator Kunesh. Uh, and I, we got to hang out at Tim Veldy's farm, and we got to see a, a, a farmer's union tractor from 1919 or something like that. It was wonderful. Uh, Senator Gustafson, we got to spend some time with uh, Leaf and the Good Acre talking about food hubs and food access. Uh, Senator Dornick, uh, you and I got to spend a whole lot of time with Sadie and her cows, a couple other different places. Senator Dornick came all around the state with us a number of times. I want to reinstate uh, this one more time, is that every time we went to one of these 50 some different places. We invited every single member of this committee to come to one of those sessions and every legislator who represented that area because we're cool like that. And these are the folks who showed up. Uh, Senator Kupek, uh, we had spent a great deal of time around a statue of the biggest sugar beet in the world, <laughs> which was worth every minute. And Senator Dames, you and I got to spend some time down in your neighborhood uh, and, and uh, learn a little bit more about uh, a particular crop rotation in the situation. That was pretty fantastic that we got to learn a lesson that one of your constituents gives to second graders. So it was perfectly timed for where we are. So I want to thank those members who stood up for agriculture, the individuals who I mentioned, including Senator Westrom, who unfortunately isn't here, but who came to a number of events with us. We spent some time with Erica and Eric's turkey barn together, Senator Westrom did. Members showed up for Minnesota agriculture, and I want to thank those individuals I've mentioned for doing so. Um, uh, and I also want to make another point about these tours. They were not in any sense to remedy a deficit. 
We didn't go to a farm because we didn't know anything about farming. We went to a farm because we care about farmers. It's not just about learning what's happening in a farm because that would, in a sense, be useless because there are as many kinds of farms as there are farmers in the state of Minnesota. We went to the farms to build relationships with people so that they know who to call when they need something. That's us. So thank you to the members for coming to these uh, 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 visits that we did uh, over the, the interim. And thanks to all of you for coming back. Today, um, we've got some updates, some informational updates uh, about some of the stuff that we did last session. We're going to hear from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and then we'll have an update from the Board of Animal Health. So uh, first up, if we could, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Vauble, uh, Ms. Medina, and uh, I think it's just the two of you, right? right. Do you would please uh, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Putnam and members of the committee. Thank you so much for having us here again. It's great to see you all once again. Uh, my name is Andrea Vobble. I serve as Deputy Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and I'll have my colleague introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Medina. I serve as Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, and Commissioner Peterson sends his regards. He is doing uh, the people's work in the country of Cuba, doing some trade, uh, trade mission work for us. So um, he's sorry to be here, but he's doing good work uh, on our behalf. Um, so as, as Senator Putnam mentioned, we have a lot to update you on. Um, we'll try and go through it quickly. So we have plenty of time for um, our colleague, Dr. Haves, and time for questions. But we are so grateful for everything that you all passed uh, last year. And we um, are very, very proud of the work that our team at the department have, have done over the last few months. Um, and so it's exciting to be able to, to share it with all of you. So I will um, send it over to Michelle to get the, the first half done. Okay, so our mission is to enhance all Minnesotans' quality of life by equitably ensuring the integrity of our food supply, the health of our environment, and the strength and resilience of our agricultural economy. Uh, last session with the budget, uh, our total general fund investment for fiscal year 24 and 25 is $163 million, and then for 26, 27, $125 million. So of those funds, this is, the first one is the MDA IT modernization. So we received $1 million in fiscal year 24 and 25, as well as the fee, authoriz fee authorization. So this funding helps to support our old and outdated IT systems to allow our clients to interact with us more on the internet and not submit paper forms to us. So we're excited to get this going. We're already transitioning our services to Salesforce. So this is a more modern and widely used platform to do this work, so we're excited for this. Additionally, we did apply for a minute grant um, for the technology modernization fund, and we did get a grant to help supplement these funds as well. So still more work to, for this ongoing and more money needed, but we're excited to have this initial investment. For the egg emergency account, we received $1 million in fiscal year 24. This fund helps us um, ensure our agency is ready to respond for egg-related emergencies in a timely manner. So one of the most prominent ones you know of is high path, highly pathogenic avian influenza, or HIPATH. Uh, these funds have been very helpful for that outbreak, as well as preparing for African swine fever, which is not here yet, but we're preparing for that. So the current fund balance is sitting over just $1.5 million, and we share this fund with the Board of Animal Health. The Agri Meat, Poultry, Egg, and Milk Processing Grants, we received $2.5 million in years 24 to 25 and $250,000 ongoing. So this helps the startup modernization and expansion of meat, poultry, egg, and milk processing businesses with investments in equipment and infrastructure. Um, in fall, fiscal year 24, we received 34 proposals, requested about 2.1 million, and we were able to award 812,000 to 18 different grantees, and this grant will reopen again this February. A farm to school increase, so we received 2.3 million in fiscal years 24 to 25, and 2.588 in fiscal years 26, 27. So these funds help schools buy more fruit, vegetable, meat, poultry, grain, and dairy for schools and early, early childhood education centers. Um, so these grants help reimburse them for purchasing equipment to process this food, as well as the raw agricultural products. So within this funding, there's a $150,000 rider for the coordinator position. We hired Kate Siebold as our farm to school coordinator. So she helps um, different schools and centers find these grants and connect with farmers and, and keep these programs going. So the different programs we have are first bite, full tray, and equipment grants. In fiscal year 24, we received 1.8 million requests from 91 applicants. We were able to award 935,000 to 48 schools and 14 early child care centers. 
And just one quick note on this. Um, we heard from a lot of folks around the state about um, uh, expanding eligibility for this grant, particularly for in-home daycare providers, knowing that that's really a, a, a large source of, of need in the, um, especially in rural areas. So um, we are going to be requesting the the, um, the committee does uh, expand the eligibility for in-home daycare centers. So I'm sure many of you have heard about that, and we we heard that loud and clear, and agree that it's a, a good use of funds. But if they're getting federal dollars for the farmers markets grants, we received two hundred thousand dollars in fiscal year 24-25. This is a one-time grant program for infrastructure to support EBT, SNAP, um, and other related programs at farmers markets. And so same with that last one, we're going to have another technical change to this bill to, um, to make this program more effective for the farmers markets and really meet their needs. For the Good Acre, Good Acre Leaf Program, uh, we received $600,000 in fiscal year 24-25 in a one-time appropriation. This is for the Good Acre's Local Emergency Assistance Farmer Fund. Um, $300,000 per year is to compensate emerging farmers for crops donated to hunger relief organizations in Minnesota. And we've already completed fiscal year 24 for this program. The Agri-Urban Agriculture was $4 million in fiscal years 24, 25, and is ongoing. This was an increase from originally $550,000 per year. The fiscal year 24 RFP, or Request for Proposals, was released in late January and is open until March, 30, March 21st. So some of the changes to this was an increased focus on community development in school districts, increased maximum awards from 50,000 to 100,000, and expanded eligible costs, including transportation and translation. The Agri Good Food Access Program was $1 million in fiscal year 24 to 25 and is ongoing. Again, this is an increase from 550,000 per year. The fiscal year 24 RFP was released in February and is open until May 31st. We also increased the maximum award to $75,000. The Deep Winter Greenhouses, this was money for a greet. This was $700,000 in fiscal year 24 to 25 in one-time funding. So this is for farm-scale winter greenhouses and development coordinated by U of M Extension, RSDP. Um, and the MD has already issued the contract to the U of M for this program. Dairy Program 2.0, this was $4 million in one-time funding in fiscal year 24. This money is available through June 30th of 2026. So this is for the Dairy, Assistant, Dairy Assistance Investment Relief Initiative, or Dairy with an I. We did Dairy 1.0, and that was $8 million of state fundings to incentivize farmers to purchase a five-year DMC, or Dairy Margin Coverage Protection. The Minnesota farmers who did sign up for DMC have received $280 million in federal payments. So we think that small $8 million investment really paid off for our dairy farmers and brought quite a bit back to them and, and kept them hopefully hopefully making a profit here. So the DMC coverage expired at the end of 2023. Um, the DMC is tied to the Farm Bill, so we're currently waiting to announce, waiting for USDA to announce either one-year extension um, for DMC option this winter. Um, we're still not sure, it just really depends on the Farm Bill. Um, they might also authorize a five-year DMC option, so we're just dependent on that. So we, the funds are available through 2026, so we have time yet to, to spend those. Ms. Bedina, if I ask you, ask you to pause for a moment. Senator Westrom, you have a question? Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, just on the Dairy with an Eye program, um, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Did you have, uh, what was the percentage of the premium that we offered, or was it the same as the prior round? Um, I, I'm trying to recall, but I'm thinking it was like 50% of the insurance premium or 35% of it would get paid if they took uh, took a five-year contract. Can you give us those details? Did, did we do it the same or did we pay for more premium or less premium? More people enroll or less people enroll? Just a little bit more of those numbers. Ms. Medina. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, so I, I'll double check on the percentage. I think it was maybe 50%, but I will double check. We actually haven't opened um, Dairy 2.0, as we're calling it. That's not the technical name that you all put in the bill or anything. Um, that's just our own um, fun name for it. Um, so we, we're holding on that, that amount of money until we get a little bit more clarity on what the, the federal government's going to do with the Farm Bill, whether we do a one-year extension if, if FSA does do that, or um, if the feds do authorize a five-year DMC option through, through a Farm Bill. So we haven't um, opened up that second round using the additional $4 million you all passed last year. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Westrom. Deputy Commissioner, the, at this point, the money is still sitting in the account. Nothing, nothing's gone out. For, for renewals. Deputy Mr. Commission. Chair, Senator Westrom, that is correct. And, and, and I guess to that end, is it open to somebody that maybe didn't 
sign up the first time or did but didn't take the, the, the subsidy? Or is it only to those that have been in the program already? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, I think we're still working through that. I think it would be open to anybody who has not all previously done it. So we would um, offer a, a, a new round once we opened it. Um, there is a little bit of wiggle room because we do have the funds available till 2026. So we're hoping to get some clarity here shortly that we could get this out and out and to the countryside. Uh, further follow up, Senator Westrom? And then international trade support. So we received $150,000 per year ongoing to expand our international trade office. It was an office of one, now up to an office of two. So very excited to have doubled our capacity. So um, we have hired Lisa Stout actually from Wisconsin to come over to the Department of Agriculture from the Wisconsin Department of Ag to work with Jeff Phillips on this program. So this helps support um, our trade, for trade missions, international marketing support as these demands have, for these services have really outgrown our current capacity. Uh, Ms. I actually have a question on this one myself. Um, this is the second person who'll be doing this work in the department. Can you explain a little bit how, is this new person doing this job complementing that person's work by doing different responsibilities or just doing more, not just, because you might take that back, doing more of the same thing? Uh, Mr. Chair, excellent question. Um, I guess it's a little bit of both. So um, she will be complementing some of the work that uh, Jeff Phillips does, whether it's um, additional trade missions outbound, so when we work on exports, or if we're working on bringing buyers to Minnesota to um, uh, build relationships there. So she'll be helping out with, with that, certainly, knowing that there's uh, a lot more demand for us to do more trade missions and more folks who want to come to Minnesota. I will also add, we work with, um, on, this, on the federal side, uh, something called Food Export Midwest, which is a a regional trade group that gets funding through the Farm Bill. There's a lot of work that has that goes along with that work. Um, so that's more of the, the branded or consumer packaged goods. So people in Minnesota who have um, a business that they're trying to you know build out build out markets or exports, they'll work through something like Food Export Midwest. So she's doing a lion's share of that work as well. Thank you, Commissioner Robin. Just as, a, as an aside, I'll, I'll note that a couple months ago I was talking to our friends in Soy, uh, and when this issue came up. <laughs> Good chance you could have heard their, heard their applause from where we were uh, down in Mankato uh, when they heard about this, how incredibly excited they are about these uh, increased opportunities and the great work that you're doing on this front. So thank you. And then the Agri Biofuels Infrastructure Grants. This was 6.75 million in fiscal year 24-25 with 3 million per year ongoing. This helps our retail service stations upgrade their infrastructure to increase access to and sales of motor fuel blends containing at least 50% ethanol. For fiscal year 24, we received 54 proposals requesting 9.87 million. We awarded 3.04 million to 16 stations. You'll also note in the picture that is Michelle Medina, um, who is in that picture and sitting right in front of us. So that, that was cool. getting E15. Yeah, getting E15, of course. Okay, and then for coming soon, we have the cooperative development uh, grants. This is news by name at $200,000 per year. We'll have the RFP out next week. And then also the meat processing hiring incentive grants. Also new this by NEM at 220,000 per year in fiscal year 24 and 322 in fiscal year 25, and we'll have that RFP out later. And you'll notice um, a lot of RFPs coming out in February. Um, we've uh, been, just a big shout out to our grant staff who were able to um, kind of flow out all of these RFPs with these new programs and the, the um, increased funding in current programs. We've been um, able to keep afloat, but we're really proud of the work that they're doing. Um, so the meat processing liaison, you will recall that $75,000 per year ongoing. That did leverage $75,000 from the feds, so it was $150,000 total. Uh, it's a meat processing navigator position at MDA to assist new and prospective meat processing plants to help them navigate the food safety regulatory requirements that are, are necessary to become a processor. Um, we did hire Megan Jansa in early fall of 2023. We also took her from Wisconsin, and as someone originally from Wisconsin, I love bringing people to Minnesota. Um, she has a lot of experience working in meat inspection work, so, oh, yes. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Valba, could you just say the word Wisconsin again one more time? <laughs> uh, it's, it's the correct way, Wisconsin. Just, I'm just, yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Our down payment assistant grants increased, so we got uh, an additional $250,000 per year ongoing. This is a program um, that we're really proud of. Uh, these funds are to award and administer down payment assistance grants for farmers buying land for the very first time. So we had an additional um, dollar amount, but with the $250,000 increase, we are at a million dollars per round. 
So just to give you a snapshot of what we did in the first round, so fiscal year 23, so January through June of last year, we did do the program on a first come first served basis. So we had applications exceeding the allocation that we had, I think it was about $500,000 in less than 10 minutes. So certainly a great need out there. 32 awardees were given $478,500 total. Uh, the legislative report is available right now. It ha has a little bit deeper dive into more data and the awardee demographics. Um, that would have been sent to you all at, um, here on the committee, but you can also find it on our website or we're happy to provide it to you um, at, at any time. So the round two of this program is um, ongoing. So there were some legislative changes made last year. So we did replace the first come first serve basis with a random lottery. Um, we did give preference to emerging farmers and then double the funding again to $1 million. You also allowed us to carry over funding to allow more times for awardees to close on purchases because as you all know, um, land purchases can be um, uh, kind of back and forth and take a little time. So um, we wanted to give people a little flexibility on that. So far, we've awarded 32 grants at 480,000 so far. Um, we anticipate round three opening in fiscal year 25, so late year, late summer or early fall of this year. The Emerging Farmers Office expansion. So we were uh, given $1.2 million in fiscal year 24 and 25, and then 1.7 in um, fiscal year 26, 27. Uh, you'll recall that as far as we know, we're the first of the kind in the country to have an office of this nature. We've had uh, one staff person for an, a couple of years now. Um, this funding has allowed us to increase the staff capacity we have for the work that this office does. Um, that's in the way of a, um, uh, grants management as well as outreach and engagement. Um, it also created a new grant program called the Beginning Farmer Equipment and Infrastructure Grants, which we are currently um, designing right now, along with um, technical assistance to uh, BIPOC producers and food system businesses. Um, we also, there's 275,000 in technical assistance grants to CDFIs or Community Development Financial Institutions. We're working on designing that program as well. And then um, we do have $25,000 for translation services and that, that um, is given out on an a, as needed basis. A couple of hires there. So Lillian Otiano is the, um, the Emerging Farmer, the uh, EFO's office first director. She was hired in October 2023. She was our longtime outreach and engagement specialist. Um, so knows the, the state very, very well. And then we also hired Emily Toner as our senior grant specialist in early January. Um, and she is busy already designing that new grant program I just referenced. The Great Indemnity Fund, $10 million passed in fiscal year 24 one time. This appropriation from the general fund is to establish a grain indemnity fund that will protect producers who have unpaid grain sales when grain buyers or warehouses become financially insolvent. Um, you'll recall that after the initial investment, the fund will be replenished through fees associated either with sales of grain or in lieu of current bonding costs. Um, as of uh, since since the the bill passed, forms and processes have been updated so that claims can be made on the indemnity fund. But just to be clear, no valid claims have been made against the fund to date. Um, we were also tasked by, by all of you to um, convene our grain advisory group. So we had them meet a few times throughout the fall and um, submitted a report to you earlier this month on financials in bonding. Um, and then we did come up with a couple of recommendations that you will see come before the committee. Um, we have begun scoping what we required to collect the funds should the indemnity drop below the $8 million. So you might recall um, the threshold that if, if it drops below $8 million, we're required to collect those fees to replenish up to the $10 million. But again, we've had no claims made against the fund at this point. Funding for the Pollinator Research Account, $800,000 in fiscal year 24 and $100,000 per year starting in fiscal year 26. This is funding to the University of Minnesota, although it requires consultation with us at the MDA. This money funds research and outreach activities focused on improving pollinator habitat and pest management practices that reduce the effects of pesticides on pollinators. So that was transferred to the Board of Regents, the $800,000. Uh, the U of M issued a request for proposals in October of 2023, and there was a review committee that scored projects in uh, at the end of last year. We were invited to the scoring meeting, but um, didn't have any formal role in selecting the projects. But again, we were consulted, um, and the money has been given to the, legend, to the uh, Board of Regents. Um, another appropriation to the university is a heritage oil seed research dollar, $600,000 in fiscal year 24-25. So that, appro that $300,000 appropriation for fiscal year 24 has been transferred to the university at this point. Um, there are one-time grant to the U to evaluate, propagate, and maintain genetic diversity of oil seeds, grains, grasses, legumes, and other plants that were in commercial distribution and in use before 1970. Our Soil Health Financial Assistance Program, you might remember that was a pilot program and then we came to you and, and asked for additional funding and we were, are so grateful for that. Um, we received $1.25 million in fiscal year 24-25 and $639,000 per year ongoing. We also did um, uh, 
get uh, quite a bit of clean water funds as well. I think we have $3 million uh, there. I, that's a mistake. I think it's more like $3.5 million. Um, so you'll remember that the, the original amount that we got for the pilot program, we got 13 times the amount of requests than we had dollars. So we, we certainly know there's a need and an interest. Um, so it does support the state's healthy soil management plan through voluntary implementation of soil health management practices by awarding funds to access specialized equipment and machinery. Popular equipment that we're seeing are no-till drills and air seeders, strip-till machines, and other cover crop seeding equipment. You'll see down there that for the fiscal for this fiscal year, this round, um, we got 284 applications. We are able to uh, award 81 at about 2.3 million dollars, um, but we did have 8.4 million dollars in requests um, for that for that round. Continuous, li continuous living cover grants. We uh, received $500,000 in fiscal year 24-25. These are for grants to organizations in Minnesota to develop enterprises, supply chains, and markets for continuous living cro cover crops and cropping systems, or CLC, you might hear them, in the early stages of commercial development. So um, you'll hear a lot of the, the forever green type crops. So things like agroforestry, perennial biomass, perennial forage, perennial grains, things like Kernza, Pennycrest, Winter Camelina. Um, so we did have a, an RFP process for these dollars that closed October of 2023, and we selected five of the 15 projects at $50,000 per grant. The legislature asked us to look at PFAS in pesticides. Um, so we were uh, allocated $250,000 in fiscal year 24-25 to do a PFAS and pesticide review to determine which pesticides contain PFAS. We hired a temporary research scientist to do this work and write the review report. Um, an, inter an interim report was submitted to all of you at the beginning of this month. Again, happy to provide that if, if you need it. Um, and a final report is due to all of you by February of 2025. So um, we're continuing that work with the interim research uh, position that we hired at the MDA. The fertilizer inspection fee increase. So during the last legislative session, our statutes were changed uh, to state that the com by commissioner's order, the commissioner must set the inspection fee at no less than 39 cents per ton and no more than 70 cents per ton. The commissioner must hold a public meeting before increasing the fee by more than five cents per ton. So as of January 1st of this year, the inspection fee was increased by five cents per ton so that the new inspection fee is 44 cents per ton. Uh, at the same time, the Agricultural Chemical Response and Reimbursement Account, or ACRA, as most of you know it, the fee there on fertilizer tonnage was reduced from 48 cents per ton to 32 cents per ton. So on this slide, you'll just see between the inspection fee, um, AFRAC, which you, um, is a, a, another fee that we do with um, um, fertilizer research, and then ACRA. In 2023, farmers were paying $1.27 per ton, and in 2024, with the changes that we made, it, they're paying $1.16 per ton. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, our presentation is concluded. Very grateful again for all that you provided and happy to stand for any questions you may have. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, going back to the slide on continuous living cover grants, you selected five of the 15 projects uh, at $50,000 per grant. So um, can those remaining projects then be reconsidered in 2024 for 2025? to get money, because you have $250,000 left in your that grant account, just looking at uh, looking ahead as to what will happen with those other projects that were ap applied for. Yeah. Commissioner Wobble? Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, um, I, I need to check with our staff, but I'm pretty sure we'll issue a new RFP, but they would be welcome to reapply. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your report, uh, Deputy Commissioner. I was going to ask on the biofuels infrastructure grants. I see there's 54 proposals requested and 16 stations. Uh, how do you choose and then the money, is it evenly or do they uh, adjust according to the need mm -hmm. or is it just a average out of the $3 million divided by 16? Commissioner Rowell? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dornick. Um, so we do, it's a competitive grant process. So we do have a review committee. Um, they will, um, it's not totally even, it's dependent upon the need and whatever project they're trying to do. So if they're trying to maybe do an underground storage tank versus um, changing some of their pumps, they might just have different um, total project costs. Um, so it's just dependent upon um, what they request and if it's within the eligibility requirements of the RFP. Um, so the, um, and all of that is public once we, we complete those, those documents um, or those uh, agreements. So we can certainly share all of that with you. But um, it, it's not sort of an even split amongst the, the money. It's dependent upon the need and what type of project they're doing. 
Senator sure. Dornick. Thank you for that. Um, so there's definitely a, a need out there for more. I could see some of the other uh, requests too. There's this many requests and only this one fulfilled. But thank you for what you do on uh, helping out there. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And on the same subject, uh, I think this would be the third year we probably funded this program. Is that correct? I think so. Do you, do you know how many stations we've been able to help so far? Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, I'd have to get that exact number for you. I, and we might have had it a little longer than three years. I'd have to double check on that. There's been years in the past where we've leveraged some agri dollars for um, biofuels to, to get federal funds as well. Um, so I'd have to get that number for you, but it's been quite significant. I will say the last three years or so, we've focused a lot on um, the smaller stations, the sort of mom and pop around the state. Um, but we certainly lead the nation in, um, in availability around the state for, for E15 and higher blends of ethanol. But we can get that number for you. Thank you. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Uh, Assistant Commissioner, do you have any idea how many of these small mom and pop stations we have left to do yet? Commissioner Bubble. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Dames, I, I don't off the top of my head, but certainly can, can get that for you. I think we, um, we work a lot with um, a lot of folks out in the, the um, marketplace, folks like Minnesota Biofuels Association who work closely with some of these smaller stations. I think they have, have somewhat of an idea, and we can, we can look at those numbers. Thank you. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, a couple questions uh, following up on the biofuels. Uh, Ms. Vobble, uh, I think, uh, is, it, is there a cap on the size of operation uh, or how many stores they can apply for? I was thinking it's 10, but I, I don't remember offhand. I'm thinking it largely is targeted towards what you'd consider maybe the smaller mom and pop, not, not, not a big store that's probably putting in 50 stores uh, across a region. Or, do you recall offhand? Commissioner Bubble. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, I'm 99% I'm sure it's 10. Um, we don't have our subject matter experts here because it is a, a, a holiday, so um, I apologize that we can't uh, bring her up here. But um, I, I can confirm for you, but I'm 99% sure it's 10, to I, your point, to, to try and I'm 99% sure yeah. it's 10 also. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes us 198% sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, the, I'm on the right track, I think, if, if you are, and hopefully we're both are. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Westrom, Deputy Commissioner, the, uh, going back to the uh, local uh, produce uh, products uh, dollars that you're looking to expand into daycare um, how, how is that going to work um, those is it to daycares that don't already receive subsidy for for children and what's stopping uh, those markets from just developing now and selling to daycares um, and, and I guess I'm wondering if this is the best direction or best use of these funds um, when, when they're already getting a subsidy in, in a lot of cases in, in, in the daycares, uh, if they're getting CCAP money or, or other uh, state subsidies to, to provide for those children, which part of that is providing a meal already for, for those kids. So are we kind of double doubling up here or, or explain how that's going to how that's going to go if you're expanding into this arena. Mr. Bubba. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, I, I will not pretend to be a, an expert on CCAP or what kind of subsidies they, they might be receiving or what they can spend it on. I know um, the past couple of years we've opened up a, a public portal asking for folks for ideas or things that they could see in, in our budget or whether it's policy or budget that, that we could be doing to help serve um, Minnesotans better. And uh, we got a huge response from in-home day care providers on this specific point. I think um, part of it is that um, they lack the um, maybe the equipment or the infrastructure to be able to take some of the fresh fruits and vegetables that they want to offer the 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 little Minnesotans that they they serve, um, as well as the increased expense of just getting some of those higher premium, um, you know, local locally grown goods. So I think there's just a desire to be able to provide those nutritious foods locally grown by farmers in their neighborhood um, so that they can both build a market for their local community but also um, provide healthy foods for the folks in their in their care. So, so Mr. Chair, uh, Deputy Commissioner, 
do you see it being like a one-time uh, grant that maybe helps them build out that, that connection and, and maybe uh, uh, equipment if they need or, or things for preparation? Or is it an ongoing, do you think, an expense every year? We're going to just uh, keep subsidizing their food. And, and I guess to that end, are we going to make sure that there's not a doubling up if the daycare provider is already getting reimbursed for food seems like we shouldn't be giving a double doubling up on the grants um, in, in, in this case. So those would just be some concerns I hope we're looking at as, as we're going through to be best stewards of the taxpayer dollars and, and help foster those markets, get them started, but, mm -hmm. but are we setting ourselves up for an ongoing dependency year after year, or is it, is it a one-time shot in the arm, get things going and get the markets connected and, and, and move on to others that that maybe haven't connected yet. Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, I think we'd still sort of work out what this would look like for an RFP, because certainly it would be competitive grants. I know certainly our team tries to, and when we have review committees, we try and um, sort of spread it around the state as much as we can to, to new applicants as well, um, trying to get to your point, build those markets and get as many new people into the program as, as um, it's a big job of the farm to school coordinator that we, that we mentioned, um, sort of building those new outlets all over the state. So um, we also do work with a lot of other agencies, um, our sister agencies on um, funding they might be getting or, or with the Department of Revenue and others. So I'd have to check with our staff on kind of how we build out that RFP, but certainly something I can bring back to them for consideration. Senator Westrom. Members, other questions and comments? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Going back to farmer marker grants, uh, and this is for 24-25, it says a one-time grant program for infrastructure to support EBT, SNAP. And I'm wondering um, how those grants and what amounts will be given out to those farmers, farmers markets when, when it goes into play. Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, so we actually haven't um, doled out those funds quite yet. We're working on some technical changes to allow for increased eligibility costs for those, and we'll be coming to this committee for, for that as well. So we haven't developed that quite yet. Um, but with $200,000, and um, we've got um, I, one of the highest number of farmers markets, I think, in the country, um, we want to make it that it's, it's um, impactful for that market, but also that we can serve a, a large number of, of markets. So um, we're still developing that, but um, we'll certainly be chatting with you more about what some of the eligible costs would be for that grant program as we, as we build it. Senator? Members, any other questions or comments for our friends from MDA? Seeing none, thanks for visiting with us. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, uh, we have an update from the Board of Animal Health. Uh, Dr. Brian Haves, if you would please uh, assume uh, a position and uh, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Uh, Chair Putnam and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to give you an update. My name is Dr. Brian Haves. I am the Minnesota State Veterinarian and Executive Director for the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. Uh, just a quick update since I'm fairly new to this position. Um, I thought I'd give you kind of my background. Um, I was appointed to the executive director state veterinarian position in August of 23. Prior to that, I served as the interim executive director from uh, April to August. And prior to that, I was a uh, senior veterinarian for swine programs, equine programs, uh, livestock concentration points, and biologics for the Board of Animal Health. Prior to that, I was a private practice veterinarian uh, serving in companion animal medicine. I've worked in mixed animal practices, uh, equine practices, poultry companies, as well as uh, about 12 years in academia. I, I did um, significant training in uh, veterinary technician education. Um, our board member, so uh, the the mission statement for the Board of Animal Health is to protect the health of the state's domestic animals through education and cooperation with uh, veterinarians, producers, owners, and communities. Um, I wanted to share with you some changes to our board. Uh, previously, we had a six-member uh, board of directors. Uh, last legislative session uh, changed that to seven board members to include a companion animal veterinarian um, to be part of the board. 
as well as an update to our uh, tribal member for the board. We already had a tribal member. Um, Mr. Uh, Alex Stady is a member of the Shakopee Minwakanton Sioux community. He's also a livestock producer. Um, and then Dr. Abigail uh, Maynard is our companion animal veterinarian that joined us in the fall. So we're excited to have a full complement of, of board members to uh, guide us through our mission. Highly pathogenic avian influenza is kind of the big topic for the Board of Animal Health. Um, I'm happy to say our last detection for this uh, most recent event was on January 10th of uh, this year, uh, backyard flock. We are continuing to do surveillance and uh, testing suspected flocks. We, we've had a couple of calls for backyard flocks with sick birds that owners were concerned about. Again, I'm, I'm happy to report those, those tests have come back negative. Um, we are demobilizing our instant response team. So those individuals that we've, we've scavenged from other agencies, including the Department of Agriculture, Department of Health, um, and, and our own uh, Board of Animal Health uh, staff that have been extending themselves to help with the poultry program are in the demobilizing phase of the response. Uh, we are preparing for a spring wave. We know that a high path avian influenza comes with the migrating birds. Uh, these strange, strange winters that we have seem to be uh, strange as far as the migration is concerned as well. Um, ironically, last year we did not have much of a, a high path response or um, activity in the spring. Um, again, attributed to some strange migration patterns. It's anyone's guess what's going to happen this year. It could come earlier. It could come later. It could, it could vary as well, but uh, preparing nonetheless. Uh, costs for the response that started uh, last fall in October up till December was roughly 450000 in staff time. Uh, this slide is uh, just an update on the, the actual cases we had. Again, these started in early October of 23, and um, as I mentioned, the last case was uh, early January of this year. So total cases were 39 of the highly pathogenic avian influenza. 23 of those were commercial turkey operations. Um, 10 were commercial turkey breeder operations. One was a commercial table egg layer premises and five were backyard premises. Uh, this slide is our, our latest disease of concern in the poultry world. So avian metanumovirus is uh, a disease that's not foreign to Minnesota, but the, the recent confirmation of uh, subtype B in, in Virginia and North Carolina is of concern. So um, late 90s and early 2000s, Minnesota actually had this avian metanumavirus subtype C. Um, there was significant um, surveillance and actually a vaccination process in place that was able to eliminate the, the existence here in Minnesota. Um, at the time, there were uh, surveillance was done just to determine how how infectious, how prevalent this disease was at the, that time. Forty to sixty percent of flocks tested were actually positive. Um, the the concern about this disease, um, I've got some some pictures up of a, a chicken and a turkey with swollen sinuses. You can kind of appreciate the the heads are are inflamed and, and enlarged. Um, anyone who's who's had a sinus infection and has had the flu recognizes those symptoms are somewhat similar. So therein lies our concern. Not only is this a, a devastating disease in the poultry industry, but it, it's got some characteristics that are very similar to highly pathogenic avian influenza. So um, as, if, as if that disease isn't more uh, difficult enough to diagnose and, and deal with, now we have kind of a mimicker of, of that disease. Um, the, the surveillance for avian metanumavirus ended in um, 2010 for our commercial flocks, uh, 2018 for, for breeder flocks. At that time, it was, it was assumed that this uh, subtype C was eliminated from Minnesota. Um, again, it's, it's this new version, the subtype B, that, that has us concerned. We don't have any, any uh, cases of it in, in Minnesota at this time. Um, we're currently just monitoring what the, the situation is nationally. Right now, it seems to be isolated to that, that uh, southeastern part of the United States, but as the, the country's uh, largest turkey producer, we certainly are keeping tabs on it. Uh, we've been in, in uh, talks with 
the Minnesota Turkey Growers Association, as well as the Minnesota Poultry Testing Lab on uh, surveillance activities, how to, how to improve our surveillance. Currently, the, the Minnesota uh, Poultry Testing Laboratory has capability for testing the, the original subtype C, and they're working on developing uh, methods to detect the subtype B that we're concerned with. Um, reports are that we should have that testing available by the end of February. Uh, Dr. Haves, I'm sorry for interrupting, but um, how does this how does this spread this uh, AMPV? Uh, it, clearly, you know, high path comes from waterfowl. Um, how does this get introduced to a flock? Chair Putnam, that's an excellent question. That's still under under evaluation. So previously, the subtype C was was aerosolized. There was suspicion that it was also carried by migratory birds, but probably more of a biosecurity issue. So carried by uh, workers from farm to farm. As, as we recognized with our highly pathogenic avian influenza in 2015, that was kind of the magic combination um, brought here by migratory birds, brought into the barns by, by farm workers. So that seems to be the, the case with uh, the subtype B, but there is some anecdotal evidence that it's also existing in wild birds. Um, subtype C that we had previously was primarily a turkey disease. Subtype B seems to affect all species of of domestic poultry. Uh, I, I guess I, I brought those two up. So I, I don't want to I don't want to raise a lot of alarm about this um, avian metanuma virus. I just kind of want to bring it to your attention as um, a point of interest that you know dealing with one disease event is is difficult. Dealing with uh, a double gets gets a little hairy, gets a little tricky. So. Um, this was kind of to reinforce our partnership, our collaboration with University of Minnesota Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, as well as the Minnesota uh, Poultry Testing Lab out in Wilmer. Um, my next slide, African swine fever. So African swine fever continues to be the disease of concern in, in swine in um, the world, and, and particularly in, in the U.S. that, as of now, does not have African swine fever. Uh, Minnesota is the second largest pork producing state in the country, so we're very concerned about what would happen to our, our uh, industry here in Minnesota if this disease would, would end up here. Um, we've, we've been working on uh, plans, so every state does their own kind of uh, response plan preparations for African swine fever. We had a plan uh, developed in 2019. This year we, we revamped that plan. We edited it a little bit with uh, the new information that we've got. Uh, these plans are based off of uh, USDA uh, preparation and response plans. So they're not, it's not every state acting individually. They're just kind of implementing the, the USDA plans per the, the state's uh, swine industries. Um, other activities around the swine world that we've been involved in, we worked with uh, the DNR on a report on feral pigs in Minnesota. We're, where surveillance is at, how we respond to those, um, those uh, requests to investigate. Uh, that, that report is, I think, being presented next week to the legislature. Um, part of that was also relative to some, some concerning reports coming from Canada. You've, you've heard the, the reports, you've read the articles about the, the Canadian super pigs. Um, that's that's uh, supposedly going to be wreaking havoc on our United States. Um, I, I've been <laughs> actually relieved to have some more conversations with our Canadian counterparts on this, this uh, possibility, and it's not as dire as we had previously heard. So um, I, I was at the Minnesota Port Congress last week, and we had the opportunity to visit with our Canadian counterparts. Their interpretation of the, the feral swine problem in Canada is they do exist, but it's not insurmountable. It's not something that they can't control, and they do feel they can eradicate the, the feral swine within 10 years. So um, they're valuable partners, however, because of some concerns of uh, reports where these feral swine are, how close they are to the, the United States border, and um, a lot of that was dispelled, actually, in the, the meetings we had last week. Um, most, of the, most of the occurrences are in... Um, central Manitoba, so not, not as close to the, the border as we expected. That doesn't mean we are no less vigilant about feral swine in Minnesota, but um, we are, I guess, more optimistic that it, it's something we can, we can contain control. 
Uh, moving on to our sure. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, just uh, Dr. Can you explain a little more on super swine, you called it? And what, what exactly does that do? Um, Senator Westrom, I'm very glad that you brought that up because I've been <laughs> giggling about it for quite some time. So I'm glad you, uh, you were a grown up and asked a real question. Dr. Hayes? <laughs> Chair Putnam, Senator Westrom, good question. Um, it's, I, I hesitate not to chuckle along with you. Uh, it, it's, been, it's been a term that was coined by a researcher in, in Canada, uh, Dr. Ryan Brooks, uh, referred to these, uh, these pigs as super pigs. Um, not because they have superpowers, but because they're very resilient. So I think up to this point, we have assumed that feral swine were not an issue in northern states. They were a southern state problem and, and really couldn't survive our, our northern climate and especially the winters. Um, the, the term super pig is, is referencing that. They actually have, have become very resilient, have uh, hybridized to the point where they can survive and thrive in, in the winter conditions in Canada. So uh, another term that, that's been coined in, in Canada are pigloos. So these pigs actually burrow under snowbanks and form an igloo that they refer to as pigloos. Um, how they've been able to find some of these pigs is actually with uh, um, thermographic imaging with helicopters and they can actually see the, the steam vents coming out of these pigloos where, where the pigs are burrowed after, after they're hiding under the snow. So the, the term super pig is just reference to um, the resilience, the hybridization that's allowed them to survive and thrive in, in the, the northern climates. Mr. Chair. Senator Western. Mr. Chair, thank you, uh, Doctor. Um, so when you talk about pig loser, are, are, are these a form of um, shelter that, that might be your domesticated pigs, or is this more of a wild boar or wild pig? Running on the, in the countryside that 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 uses burrows and pig uh, uh, snowbanks to 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 uh, shelter. We talking kind of your farm pig, or you're talking a wild pig, or both. Dr. Hayes, Chair Putnam, Senator Westrom, uh, good question. These are the the pig loos I'm referring to are actual wild pigs in in Canada. But some background on that. These pigs are descendants from um, an initiative in Canada from, I believe it was the 80s, where they were trying to expand and diversify their agriculture, and, and some producers decided to bring in the, the Eurasian wild boar and, and cross them with, with domestic pigs. So these are the, the typical Russian boar pigs that you think of, uh, the razorbacks that, that we think of when we think of uh, feral pigs. So that's, that's what's... That's what's out there. They're, they're a cross between the domestic pigs and these, these Eurasian wild boars. But the, the pig loos I'm referring to are these feral pigs that are out, out and about finding snow drifts in, in swamps and other places. Senator Westrom, any follow-up? Okay. Uh, thank you for edifying us on this issue. I think we were generally pigdorant. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Chair. Just when you thought we were done talking about feral pigs. Um, so if you just briefly, because it was on the news. Was it last night, the night before? I don't know if anybody saw it, but um, this is something that actually came to my attention. And I was like, I'm going to bring this up an egg. If it comes up, and lucky me, it came up. So there are a number of reasons why this is a serious problem, which I don't think we talked about, but it, the erosion, the bacteria in groundwater, right? And they're not native to North America either. So I, I just, I, I'm saying that all because I know that, you know, this, this might become a topic of, that can sort of bleed into other subjects that we'll be talking about with feral pigs. But is there anything else that we should know about how invasive and terrible this actually is for our climate, our North American ecosystem, for farmers? Anything else that you can say about it? Just the, the, the actual danger that feral pigs can present to our, to our area? Dr. Hayes? Chair Putnam, Senator Gustafson, yes. Um, there, there is more. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. They're a very destructive species. They are they are considered one of the most invasive um, species that, that we have on this continent. And, and you're correct, they are not a native species. This is a, a species that, that settlers brought to, to this country for, uh, for food. Um, so in addition to, in addition to erosion and, and um, uh, just destruction of land, they're, they're also carrying diseases too. So uh, the magic combination, I, I referred to African swine fever at the beginning of, of this topic, the magic combination for spreading 
uh, African swine fever across the world has been feeding um, uncooked, un untreated swill and wild pigs. So the wild pigs seem to be the, the initial host for that disease and then spread it to our, our domestic pigs. So um, other diseases are, are certainly of concern as well. Uh, pseudorabies and, and swine brucellosis. Uh, we have a lot of diseases that we monitor and, and maintain um, uh, a negative uh, test for in, in this state. And the concern would be this is a group of pigs that's not tested, not controlled, not, not monitored. So we, we certainly worry about the the disease spread to our, our domestic species. Um, other things that people don't recognize is these pigs are, are omnivores. So they're not, just, they're not just herbivores, they're not just eating plants, they'll eat meat. And there's some pretty, pretty eye-opening uh, images that the DNR could share with you of, of wild pigs carrying fawns. Mr. Chair, I just, just gonna follow up. Yes, that's the one I was referring to. I mean, they will just, uh, a, a doe will have a fawn and it'll immediately be taken by these feral pigs, eat them, they'll eat bone meat, all of it. It's really bad. The erosion that they do to our croplands. I, mean, I could go on. I'm a world history teacher. That's what I did for a long time. And so we talked all about how these invasive species ended up just sort of changing our landscape in North America. But anyways, I appreciate that. And I just wanted to highlight it because it really is a problem, not just for agriculture, but for health and human services as well. So thank you. Thank you. I can keep talking if he's busy. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Um, Dr. Hayes? All right, moving on to uh, canine influenza. So in our uh, companion animal programs, we had a couple of diseases of interest this year. Uh, canine influenza was something we hadn't seen in, in Minnesota until uh, this summer where we, we had a, an influx. Uh, 106 confirmed cases, 196 suspected cases in shelters in the summer of 2023. Uh, this was a disease that was brought in from uh, some of our, our southern states that, that have uh, been having issues in, in some of their shelters and, and rescue groups, and it unfortunately found its way up to Minnesota. Uh, the Board of Animal Health was, was quick to respond and educate, coordinate uh, with clinics, dog owners, and shelters to make sure that we dampened the, the disease spread. Um, a variety of, of opportunities to educate owners on vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. So kind of the, kind of the theme, we, we certainly hear that in human medicine, but it, it rings true in, in um, our small animal and, and just animal medicine in general. Uh, another disease that, that popped up a little bit later uh, this year towards fall was a uh, disease we referred to as atypical canine infectious respiratory disease. Um, many headlines referred to this as the mystery dog illness. Um, if, if that name sounds kind of long but nebulous, that's somewhat intentional. That's, that's what we do in, in medical professions. We, we describe a disease and basically what this title says, it's a disease we don't know what causes it. So uh, mystery dog illness is, is, a, is a good title. Um, it, it, I shouldn't say it's, we don't know what causes it. Uh, the question is which, which organism causes it. So, the disease has been attributed to uh, viral infections, bacterial infections, fungal infections, protozoal infections, and mixtures of all those things. So um, the, the signs are upper respiratory signs uh, that leads us to referring to them as kind of a, a conglomerate of infectious respiratory diseases. Um, we did not have widespread um, canine infectious respiratory disease in, in the state. Um, we also did not have surveillance for it because it was not really on our radar until, until it was brought to our attention from other states in the country. Um, we were able to do some uh, connections with our partners at the University of Minnesota um, to establish surveillance. So um, Dr. Barsh, our senior veterinarian in charge of companion animal programs, reached out to the University of Minnesota as soon as we heard this disease was on the rise asked if we were seeing any, any cases at the University of Minnesota that, that could be attributed to this. Um, really none were, were reported. Uh, in the end, there, there was anecdotally probably six cases that may or may not have been this, this mystery disease, but it was another opportunity to uh, kind of exercise our collaboration with the University of Minnesota as well as the diagnostic lab. Uh, the diagnostic lab reached out to us and asked, what can we do to assist with um, surveillance in this, in this disease outbreak? So we were able to work on some, um, some plans for if this disease seemed to take off and, and was an issue in Minnesota and, and how we could better 
surveil for it and, and stamp it out. Uh, moving on to rabies. Uh, rabies is a, a disease that we share with our human counterparts, so we, we collaborate extensively with Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, this year's rabies season was was somewhat extreme. Again, uh, weather maybe had something to do with this, but we saw our rabies cases starting earlier in the summer. Typically, August and September are our, our major starting points for rabies. This year, rabies cases started in uh, June and July um, and extended all the way to December. Uh, majority of the cases were in, in bats that, that people had brought in, uh, but we did have some other unique cases. Uh, there were, I think, three cattle that were infected, and then uh, I've got a picture up there of a crazy looking weasel type creature. That's a, a fisher that was actually positive. That's, that's actually the animal. So this, uh, this animal actually attacked a woman who was leaving her, her daughter's house. Um, she didn't get bit luckily, but the animal lunged at her and she went inside and, and we actually have videos of this, this fisher continuing to try to get into the house at this, at this woman. So. Uh, the DNR was called in. The fishers are a protected species in Minnesota, but uh, DNR dispatched the animal and uh, submitted it for testing, and it was positive for, uh, for rabies. Hmm. Uh, next disease of interest for this year was anthrax. We had um, a series of anthrax cases in Kittison County in July of 2023. Um, this is the first detection of anthrax in Minnesota for more than a decade. Uh, it's a naturally occurring spore-forming bacteria found in soils. We don't consider it a risk to the public, but it, it spreads through animals through uh, contaminated soil. Um, this, uh, so anthrax is in Minnesota. That's, I guess, the point I want to make with that slide. It's, it's not, normally not something that affects our our livestock species unless we have the right weather conditions again. So typically this will, will follow a flood year where we have a lot of these spores that rise to the surface and then animals that are grazing inadvertently inhale the, the spores and uh, succumb to the, to the anthrax. When I was in um, veterinary medical school, they, they told us all of, the, all of the old cattle drive trails basically are seeded down with, with anthrax. So if anyone wants to go on a... <laughs> On a sightseeing mission, I would encourage you not to sniff the soil <laughs> where, where the cattle have trod. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a spore that, that's just seeded down in the soil. Uh, farm servants, uh, big news there is we transferred authority of the farm white-tailed deer to the DNR. Uh, the board continues maintaining oversight of all other servants, and then the mixed herds, we share responsibility with the DNR. So, Currently, we have 85 non-white-tailed deer herds and 15 mixed herds that we, we share joint responsibility with the DNR. Uh, CWD was last detected in Farm Survey Day in August of 2022. Um, this is my last slide, uh, collaboration. So the Board of Animal Health relies heavily on support and resources in emergency response to the highly pathogenic avian influenza from other state and federal agencies. Primarily, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture is our, our main partner in disease response, uh, emergency disease response, along with uh, the USDA, uh, Department of Health, University of Minnesota, all, all join forces to uh, tackle diseases when they come, and, and specifically with the uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, in addition, the board and the Department of Natural Resources continue to work on the navigating oversight of farm survey. Day. I, I think we've developed a um, unique working relationship on how that transfer of farmed white-tailed deer moves from the Board of Animal Health to the Department of Natural Resources, as well as collaborating on that feral swine and mink report that was um, asked by the legislature from last year. And Chair Putnam, that is my update. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Members, questions? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Doctor. Could you tell me what the definition is of a backyard flock? Is it a certain number? Is it where they're raised? Uh, what's the definition of a backyard flock? Dr. Yeah. Hayes. Uh, Chair Putnam, uh, Senator, yes, I, I'm glad you asked that. I, I meant to elaborate on that. So backyard flocks doesn't refer to the size of the flock. It refers to the use of the flock. So 
Uh, a commercial flock would be uh, birds that are used in commerce. So you can have a flock of 10 birds, but if you're selling the eggs commercially, that becomes a, a commercial poultry flock. Um, and actually, I should use the, the world um, uh, Animal Health Association term is non-poultry, oddly enough. So backyard flocks would be synonymous with non-poultry, which means that it's, it's poultry that's used only for consumption by the owner and not, not sold to neighbors or, or in commerce. Senator Dames. Thank you. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to ask you a question about the rabies and the, uh, you said there's an increase. So do we have a number, uh, percentage of increase when you say it's uh, more? And then the second question would be, I think you said that bats are brought in. Is that what you said or did I miss hear what you said? Dr. Hayes. Chair Putnam, Senator uh, Dornick. Y yes, uh, when, I, when I refer to the bats being brought in, they're brought into the Department of Health uh, lab for testing. So there are, there are rabies lab, that's where um, any animal that's suspect for rabies, um, either the entire animal or the, the brain of the animal is brought in for, for evaluation. Um, I don't have the exact numbers of, of rabies cases. I can certainly get that for you from our Department of Health colleagues. I don't have that in front of me. The, the increase from last year, I believe, is, is almost 100%. I think we doubled the cases from last year, but I, I can get those numbers for you. All right, thank you. Senator Dornick? Yeah, follow up. Please, Senator Dornick. And then to the uh, CWD detection, August 2022, could you give us a little um, update on, not update, but what that looked like, how many, I don't remember for sure, just a little uh, history. Dr. Hayes? Uh, Chair Putnam and Senator Dornick, I'll have to get you that information as well. That was before my time working with uh, their server program, but I can get those, those details for you. Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have two questions. I want to, I want to follow up, too, on, the, on Senator Dames and the backyard flocks. Um, so I know in our commercial poultry industry, we, we have a lot of plans in place to, to combat, uh, you know, AB, uh, the, the bird pathogens. What, what kind of plans do we have or programs do we have for people who have backyard flocks to kind of give them the information they might need to, pre to prevent uh, the spread of the disease? Dr. Hayes. Uh, Chair Putnam and uh, Senator, yes, we, we do extensive work with uh, University Extension to get word out to these backyard flock owners uh, to make sure that they're keeping their flock safe. We post information on our website. We, we do as much outreach as, as we have access to to, to get the word out. Uh, biosecurity, biosecurity, biosecurity is kind of the, kind of the, the charge that, that we lead with. We try to get that word out to uh, larger poultry shows and uh, exhibitions, certainly the state fair that was, that was um, broadly broadcasted and, and uh, explained. So um, again, we rely on our, our, our colleagues at the um, University of Minnesota Extension to, to reach out to some of those that, that wouldn't, wouldn't get the information through the, the same routes that the industry does. Mr. Quebec? Thank you. Uh, and totally changing gears uh, to, the, uh, to pets or companion animals. Um, have we seen vaccination rates declining also in pets. I think I saw and heard a news story about that. And if we do, do we track that in Minnesota in terms of vaccination rates on, on companion animals? Dr. Hayes? Uh, Chair Putnam, Senator, uh, yes, that uh, anecdotally, I, I, I believe that's true. That's not something we track at the Board of Animal Health. We, we don't have uh, vaccination requirements per se for, for all companion animals. But um, as a veterinarian, I, I can attest to that, that, yeah, there's, there's kind of a climate of, of uh, declining in, in vaccinations. I, I think really the, the, the point that's being made or, or the, the attempt is more strategic vaccinations. I think, I think we're learning vaccines work differently than we previously thought and, and perhaps we don't need to vaccinate as much. Um, but sometimes that gets mistranslated to we're over vaccinating and you shouldn't vaccinate at all. Um, ultimately, we, we need to know that the animals are protected. There's ways of checking titers to, to ensure that animals have the proper the proper level of immunity to these diseases we're vaccinating for. Um, and then some diseases we just haven't had here. It hasn't been a big, a big uh, push to vaccinate for, for diseases that we don't normally see. I, I would also suggest that we're, we're traveling more with our pets. So um, like people, we're, we're going to see more, more diseases because we're, we're roaming around with our animals and, and they're going to be picking up diseases that we wouldn't normally have here. Thanks. Sure. Members, any uh, other questions or comments? Dr. Havens. 
Thank you, Dr. Hayes. We Thank appreciate you. your time. Members, that's the, the close of our scheduled business. I do want to briefly preview our next session. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, we will have a visit from the sugar beet growers. We'll hear an update from the Office of Broadband Development. Uh, there'll be a state of dairy presentation from Minnesota Milk and an MDA presentation on the Dairy Development and Profitability Enhancement Program. Uh, members, you may have also already noticed that um, our session on Monday will be at a novel time. We're holding a joint hearing with the Committee on the Environment on Monday, so we'll be meeting on Monday morning instead to talk primarily about um, water quality and uh, the state of nitrates in Minnesota. Senator Dornick? Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, I have an intern too, and I missed that. Oh, beginning. yes, so, absolutely. So if he would want to come up here, I put him on the spot, so he'll have to introduce himself too. Thank you, Senator Dornick, for giving us an opportunity to haze him a little bit. My name is Benjamin Walters. I'm interning under Senator Dornick and Senator Rarick. Welcome, Benjamin. Uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, just uh, housekeeping with next week, uh, I see a joint commission or joint meeting at 9 a.m. That means in what you just said, I think, answered, we, we won't have a 3 o'clock meeting. Then. That is true, Senator Westrom. Um, if my memory is correct and what my LA was just re going over earlier today with me on scheduling, it looks like the Senate is set for a photog photograph of the Senate at 9 a.m. next Monday. Not sure why they wouldn't do it at 11 when we go there anyways, but maybe you guys can help uh, push that back. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Thank you um, for flying. So I'm just, I, I'm just raising that as a potential conflict if they're going to keep a 9 a.m. Senate photograph and we have a joint scheduled meeting. Um, I'd, I'd suggest we do the photograph later, but uh, anyways, is, is that something on your radar yet? Uh, it, ha it was not, so thank you very much, Senator Western, for bringing that up. We'll, we'll talk to some people and see what we can do okay. um, on that one. I, I, and I also appreciate your priority for the committee over the photo. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I share that with you. Well, there might be a lot of other members further out that don't want to be here at 9 a.m. <laughs> we normally there's, get there's together at too. 11 anyways. So. Very good. All right, members, any other questions or comments? All right, it was great to see you again. Uh, the committee is now adjourned. <laughs>